voices. Here we go. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. High oppressed, but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse for his promise will endure. That his joy is gonna be my strength And though the sorrow may last for the night His joy comes in the morning I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord Destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse for his promise will endure that his joy is gonna be my strength and though the sorrow may last for the night his joy comes in the morning I'm trading my sorrows I'm trading my shame joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. That's right. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. 
Set the pace, set the standard. As adults, we just want to open our hearts to Jesus and say yes to him, whatever he has for us this morning. You sing out with us on this song you well know called Red Letters. There I was on death row, guilty in the first degree. The Son of God hanging on a hill. Hell was my destiny. The crowd was shouting, Crucify. It could have come from these lips of mine. The dirty shame was killing me. It would take a miracle to wash me clean. Then
just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Yes, I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Is your name is power your name is healing, your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus so shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness over And Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Cause your name is power, and your name is healing, and your name is life. Break every stronghold, shine shadows burn like a fire cause your name your name is power and your name is healing and your name is light break every stronghold shine through the shadows Jesus. 
precious Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Sing that from the very depths of your heart. Here we go. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. And Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus, shout Jesus, shout Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus cause your name is power and your name is healing and your name is life singing this morning. I tell you what, that's, uh, we've got a lot of complicated issues in life, and uh, it, a lot of times I've heard that song and I've thought, well, that seems like an awfully simple answer for, for the things we've got going on. The, you know, it mentions anxiety, it, it mentions a lot of different things, and uh, I'm thankful that no matter what our problem is, there's one person that knows what we need, and he knows us better than we know ourselves, and sometimes we think we can find a better way, and if we're trying to find the way outside of Jesus, it's not going to work. And, uh, and that's such a beautiful song, such a beautiful message. Let's all pray this morning. The ushers, you go ahead and come forward. God, we just thank you so much that, uh, that even though we can't understand everything that happens and we've got no way of knowing and no way of figuring out the answers, that, God, you've, you've given us truth in, in its fullest form. And sometimes we don't understand it and sometimes we can't comprehend it, but I'm, I'm so thankful that we don't have to, God. We love you so much. We thank you that we can just gather together and speak your name, and there's power in that. And it's not something we have to manufacture or drum up, God. You, you're real, and you're among us this morning. I pray that we'd recognize that. I pray that everything we do this morning and this week, we would speak your name. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Mm -hmm. You are dismissed.
Y'all looking for me? <laughs> Go to Romans 8 real quick, please. Man, it's good to see you guys. Really, really good to see you. Um, glad to be around adults. So, so my, you know, my intellectual level probably ranks a little more with the, the teenagers, but here we are. So we had a great time this past week. We've got some good kids here at the Ridge Church, and I'll, I'll say it lightly because I'd tell you if they weren't. We've got some, we really do have some good kids, and um, I was impressed with, uh, with them over this past week. So some of them had so much fun, they couldn't make it to church this morning. Anyway, but uh, they're awesome. We had a great time. So um, excited about all that the Lord's doing. If you weren't there last Sunday uh, for River Baptism, we were going to bring you up to speed, but the audio is not working for some reason. So hopefully, hopefully they figure that out uh, during the, the sermon, right? Oh, at least something productive will get done while I'm preaching, and we'll show you that at the end, but um, I don't know the exact count. I think we baptized 35-ish, 35, 35 to 40 last Sunday, and then um, and the week before that, I, or uh, the Sunday that we were originally supposed to have river baptism, I, I know I announced this in the 11 o'clock service, but I forgot um, with you guys last Sunday, but um, the Sunday we were originally supposed to baptize when we got rained out. Of course, I made the announcement. I said, look, if you can't be here on the makeup day, I'm not scared to baptize you in the rain. If y'all are crazy enough to go down there, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. We'll do it. And we had seven people that Sunday that called my bluff, and, um, <laughs> and we did. I mean, it was, it was lightning and thunder, and so we went down. We didn't go to Arapaho. One of the reasons we canceled the week that it rained was I was just afraid of, uh, you know, tearing up their, their campground with, uh, with the ground being muddy. But we went down to the state park um, under the bridge and, and, and baptized, like I said, seven people there that day in the rain. And there were, there were guys fishing under the bridge. They appreciated us doing that. <laughs> you know, the, the one and only dry spot they could find to fish. Um, pretty sure we contaminated it. But anyhow, it was awesome. And uh, might do some baptizing this afternoon. I had somebody text me this morning and asked me if I could baptize this afternoon. And so... We'll see what happens with that, but uh, we'll keep you posted, and uh, you're not invited to that one, but anyway, I'm just kidding. I just don't know for sure where or when, but man, somebody wants to get baptized, we'll find, we'll find a water hole somewhere and take them to it, right? Um, so anyway, very excited about what the Lord's doing, and uh, thank you to uh, Mike for covering for me Wednesday night. Didn't even get to find out how it went, but I'm sure with Mike preaching, it went, went fantastic. And so I uh, look forward to being back there this Wednesday night and just grateful for what God's doing. God's doing some big things in our community. I don't know if you realize that, and, uh, but I, I say that because I don't think we should take it lightly. Uh, the Lord is really, really doing a work in people's hearts. And I think, I believe the Lord is, if I have any read at all on what God's up to, I believe God is mending decades of, of brokenness, not just, not just in society, not just in our, in the, in the, in our common community, but I, I think even specifically in our churches um, and within the kingdom of God, I believe the Lord is doing some things to, to bring healing and reconciliation, which is needed. You know, the enemy, the enemy has masterfully kept God's people divided for a very long time. And, um, and it's, it's time we knock that off. And I understand there are some, there are some reasons that we don't perhaps fellowship with some who claim Christ. Not everybody that puts Jesus on their, on their label, um, is really a servant of Christ. And, and Jesus warned that there would be false prophets and false apostles and people would falsely come in his name. We're fully aware of that. Um, so I'm not, I'm not duped and I haven't drank the Kool-Aid of, you know, everybody names Jesus is, is following the scriptures, but there are people out there that might see things just a little bit different than we do who are not our enemy. And, and we want to partner with them and we want to, we want to love on them and we want to recognize the fact that God uses different people. And, uh, we say back in my day, different strokes for different folks, right? And that applies in the kingdom of God. Y'all awake this morning? Okay, I got a lot of stuff. I, I always say this. I feel bad sometimes, sort of. I feel bad in a not so sort of feel bad way. Um, but I do, uh, I've got a lot of ground that I need to cover today. And uh, really, hey, this mic don't sound right to me. If y'all could fix it, it might just be me, but it sounds like it's got too much low end um, in the EQ. And, uh, and so when I really get to screaming and hollering, you know what I'm saying? I don't want any feedback because I'm going to be yelling at these folks today. They deserve, I mean, it's 4th of July weekend. They need to get beat up a little bit. 
And I'm sure they were probably doing some things yesterday that they're ashamed, and it's, I'm shocked that you're even here today. <laughs> so um, I'll be berating them loudly. If you could just adjust that, I'd appreciate it. So in Romans chapter 8, there's a, there's a difficult, there's really a difficult segue here, um, difficult in the sense that it almost seems like, I've said this a couple times because it's true with the book of Romans, but um, as, you're, as you're reading and studying Romans, um, it, it seems like at different points in the book that, that Paul just almost 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 radically shifted gears um, from one topic to another without any real segue or any connection. And, and it's really not that way. It's just that uh, we tend to read it that way. And so if we're not careful when we, when we transition from, from Romans 8 to Romans chapter 9, it almost, there's almost a, a disjointed uh, topic shift. But, but the reality is it doesn't really shift as much as it may seem on the outset. So I want to say that. And then I also want to say that um, it seems like uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated topic that we're, that we're getting into. We're going to be talking about things um, as, as deep as, as predeterminate, the, the predeterminate foreknowledge of God. You know what I'm saying? I can hardly even pronounce that. Uh, but, but God's foreknowledge, what did, what, what did God see in us? Why, why us? Why are we here? Why, why are we considered in, in scriptures the chosen? Did you know that you're part of the chosen of God? How many of y'all believe in Jesus this morning? Raise your hand. You put your faith and trust in Jesus. You're the chosen of God, according to the scriptures. That's a heavy topic. And it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not easy. Like, really, it's not. If you start to try, and I've, I've told y'all this before, but uh, as I've studied the Bible for a very long time now, um, I really feel like the subject of salvation, the salvation of the human soul, is the most complicated subject in the Bible. And it's a paradox because, it, uh, conversely, it's the simplest topic in the Bible. I know that sounds contradictory, but, but God made it so simple that he said even, even us, uh, we as, as, as grown, educated adults, must come to Jesus with the faith of a child, just the tenderness and the simplicity uh, that a, 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 a child has. But, but when we dig deeper into it, we discover things like, like before he formed us in the belly, he knew us, according to Jeremiah chapter number one. We discover passages like this in Romans chapter one. This goes out to every outcast, to the just don't quite fit in. And God was somehow sovereignly at work behind the scenes. Now hear me out. Uh, while at the same time reigning sovereignly, he didn't impose himself or overthrow the value that we have as human beings to make decisions. That's crazy. It, it, like there's this, there's this radical extreme idea that if we understand at least a little bit conceptually uh, how the Bible teaches that God foreordained and God predestined and God chose, we start to get this mental image that God is in heaven like a puppet master just pulling the strings and we didn't really make any decisions on our own. God actually just made all that stuff happen and that's not true either. But on the same token, in the same breath, we, we can't look at Scripture and deny the fact that the Bible tells us that, that all along the way, God was leading, that, that God has been at work even in our darkest hours. He was there even before I came to know him and put my faith in him. He was working in my heart and in your heart. And so I'm saying this to say that if it doesn't make sense, it's okay because it's complicated. All right? But we're going to do our best to dive into this. And, uh, and so notice with me in Romans chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 28, uh, it says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Aren't you glad that all things work together for good to those who love God? And then notice this, it says, to those who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew, verse 29, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Paul asks a, a very appropriate question in verse 31. He says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So look, 
if we're the chosen of God, if we have been, if we've been predestined, if we've been called, if we've been justified and in the eyes of God already glorified, he says, if God's for us, who can be against us? That should embolden us in our faith. If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32, here's how much God cares for you. Here's, here's the price that God paid for you. He said, he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Who can, who can bring an accusation against you? Who can, who can bring up anything in the courtroom against you? Who shall bring anything against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Father, thank you for this, this truth. God, thank you for this time and opportunity that we have set before us. Your word says that, that, that opportunity uh, is presented to all men, that we all have different crossroads that we encounter in life. We all meet uh, different junctures that could alter the course of time and eternity. And Lord, I believe that today there are people here who have, who have uh, arrived at that point in time. And I pray that in this moment, you'd speak to them. I pray that you'd draw their hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would awaken us. Uh, just help us to be enthralled with your truth. I pray that you would bring it to life in our hearts, that we might live it out for your glory and honor. Father, cleanse us of all distraction. Father, any baggage that we carried in, Lord, help us just to set it aside for a little while and listen intently to the voice of your spirit. We love you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the past few weeks, we, we've been contemplating the, uh, I say we loosely, I hope you've been thinking through this with me, but we've been contemplating this question of how secure are we in Christ? How many of y'all have, have heard terms like this in your, in your church lifetime, uh, being in church, you've heard things like um, uh, the term eternal security. Have you ever heard that term before? Four of you? Cool. Um, I can see that uh, your participation level may be a little low, and so... Uh, I'll try to take that into consideration. How many of you have heard, if you were here last Sunday, by the way, you heard that term? Okay, so a little open book test here. So how many of you have heard the term eternal security in, in a church context? Uh, or once saved, always saved, you've heard that? How many of you have heard it in a negative connotation? Okay, well, it's, and, and, and rightly so, uh, because it's, it's sort of been abused, and we've treated that, we've treated that notion as if, um, you know, if a person just, you know, sort of just prays a prayer, uh, they're heaven bound with the hammer down, nothing can stop them. You know what I'm saying? Uh, when in reality, the Bible explains the, the, the truth of salvation and redemption in, in terms of absolute transformation, that when a person puts their faith in Christ, nothing outside changes, but on the inside, we are forever changed that we are transformed and being transformed into the image of Christ by from the moment that we call on the Lord I don't care if you're five years old or 50 years old from the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ God began doing a work it's called sanctification is the big word in the Bible but God began doing a work of sanctification he began changing your heart he began altering you into Jesus Christ and making you more like him and helping us overcome all these old toxic habits and, and chains and things that had us bound he made us free from that and so salvation isn't just praying a simple little prayer salvation is coming to a point of recon recognition that you're lost and you're in need of a savior and you understand that Jesus is the only way the truth and the life and you put your faith in him you're not putting your faith in a religion or in a person you're putting your faith in in the God man who died on the cross for your sin and so at that moment God's spirit takes up residence within you and so, so let me unpack that for just a second by way of introduction. Y'all know how I do. Okay, so let me give you a little introduction. Uh, but but uh, and, and by introduction, I want to just remind you of some things that we said last week. First of all, I said last week that there is no security outside of Christ. So when we, when we talk about the security of the believer, uh, I do believe that once a person is genuinely saved, they're always saved. 
I believe that, and I make, I'm, I'm not ashamed of that. I make no bones about it. I believe if a person has genuinely put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, they're born again by the power of God. They're made a son or a daughter of God, and, and they're sealed. They're in the family. We're, we're God's children. Like it or not, I'm yours. You know what I'm saying? Uh, he, he purchased us. The Bible says he adopted us. He made us his children, and we're within his family. Even if we fail, if we make mistakes, we're still God's children. But the bigger question is, have you really put your faith in Christ? And I'm not saying that to make you doubt. The last thing I'd ever want to do is make a believer doubt their salvation or doubt their standing with God. But if you're here today and you have found security in something other than Jesus Christ, I absolutely want to make you doubt that. Because anything other than Jesus Christ, I don't care what you throw out there. If you say, well, I know I'm going to heaven because I was baptized. Or I know I'm going to heaven because I've had people say, well, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. You may have always been raised in a Christian environment, but that does not mean that you yourself are a Christian. If, if that's what your confidence is, well, my daddy was a preacher, my mom taught Sunday school, or whatever, whatever thing you might throw out there, if, you're, if your reason for having confidence and assurance is anything but there came a time in my life when I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's the only answer that's acceptable. Because there is no security outside of Jesus. Anything that feels like security is a false friend. It's not actual security. Now look what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13. When we trust in Christ, it says, after you heard the word of truth, which by the way, this happened in all of us, really Ephesians 1.13 sort of uh, is a timeline of the events that happened in each and every one of our lives. Those of us who can say with confidence, look, I, I, I'm not saved because I'm good, I'm saved because God's good and I put my faith in Jesus. Well, Ephesians 1.13 really is a timeline of the events that unfolded in each of our lives individually, though our stories are unique. Here's what happened. You trusted Jesus after you heard the word of truth, and it might have been a sermon, it might have been a friend, it might have been somebody that just cared about you, that took the time to share the gospel with you. Whatever happened and however it happened in your life, you came to a juncture where you heard the word of truth. Paul's going to deal with this in Romans chapter 10, where he explains in more detail, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We all heard the word of God. We all heard the gospel at some point. And after we heard the word of truth, we put our faith in Christ. It says the gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed, once we did that, once we believed, it says you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That's a beautiful truth. That in Christ, we, we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I didn't put it on the screen, but the next verse, Ephesians 1, verse number 14, uh, says that the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That means that God put a down payment on us in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wasn't just given to us to give us goosebumps when we sing a song that we like. The Holy Spirit was given uh, to lead us and guide us into all truth. He's given to seal us under the day of redemption, and he's the down payment of the purchased possession, which is us. God bought us with the blood of Christ. And the Holy Spirit was given, you know what earnest money is. If you ever bought a house, you've put down earnest money or a down payment. He says the Holy Spirit is the down payment that ensures that God will complete the contract that he signed in the blood of his only begotten son. So there is no security outside of Jesus, but if you're in Christ, you are absolutely secure. And then number two, we sort of just, I, I try to deal with the rest of it by asking questions. And the question that I asked last week is, is essentially, but you know, okay, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I can go back and tell you when I put my faith in Christ, it was very real to me. But ever since then, I have, I've had some bad days and I've messed up and I've made some bad choices and I even wandered away from God for a, an extended period of time in my life. So what happens with me? What happens if I mess up? What, what happens if I fail God big? And I said to you last week, and I'm not saying this to, to, be, to be a smart aleck or try to be funny. I, I do try to be funny, but I'm not trying to be funny right now. Uh, but I said, you know, the, the reality is we all have. We've all messed up. And we sort of talked about how we quantify sin and how we've put a you know, big you know, dark label on some and we sort of pacify others and pretend like that's okay. When in reality, gossip is just as bad as the sins that in church cultures we, we condemn. No? Okay, cool. <laughs> Just make sure you're with me still. Uh, and so, so, so what if we fail? What if we mess up? Well, here's what Paul said in verse 31. And this is what we have to get, okay? This is the, this is the essence. I shouldn't have told you to look there yet because I got something else to say. But this is the essence 
of, if we want to call it an argument, this is the argument. And I said early on in this series in Romans, I'm about to bring some, back, some things back to your attention that I said weeks ago. This is, this is part 20 of this study. So weeks ago, back, back as early as like part four and part five, I said things like uh, the real controversy, the real question is not have I been baptized or have I done good enough or have I repented enough or did I join the right church or did I say the right words? That is not the question. The question is, are we saved by grace or are we saved by works? That's the question that we have to ask because if you answer that question, if you answer the question, if you, if you, if you form this, this hypothesis, you present this idea in this way, are we saved by grace or saved by works? If you can answer that, then that question will answer every other question. Because we try and, and, and create all, all sorts of hypothetical scenarios and, and we throw these things out there, well, what if a person claims to be saved and then they go out and commit murder? My question is, are we saved by grace or are we saved by works? I'm not going to heaven because I'm not a murderer. You hear me? I'm not going to heaven because I'm not an adulterer. I'm not going to heaven because I'm not a drunk. I'm going to heaven because I put my faith and trust in Jesus, and we're saved by grace through faith without works. So that's the question. That question answers all those hypotheticals. That question is, is, is the, the dead end to every other scenario that somebody could present. The question is, did Christ save me because of me, or did he save us because of his unmerited favor. So watch what he says. Now look at verse 31. All right. Now that I said what I wanted to say, verse 31, Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? And we're going to go back and cover some of those things. But he says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Do you see the focal point? Did you catch it? You understand the focal point when we're, when we're dealing with the subject of salvation, the focus is not you. The focus is not, you know, you've been good or you've been bad. The focus is what Jesus, the sinless, spotless lamb of God did on the cross. He said, you have to understand the price that was paid to bring you into this relationship. You have to understand that if, that if it were possible for you to do enough good, if it were possible for you to produce enough good works, if it were possible for you and I to keep the law, there is no possible way that Jesus, the lovely Lamb of God, would have ever stepped over the banister of heaven into the world that we now live in. There's no way that he would have suffered like he suffered, no way he would have died like he died, no way he would have gone through all of that if we could have done it on our own. The fact is, when we were without strength, the Bible says in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. So Paul circles back to the cross and he says, you've got to understand it was never you to begin with. So it's not about whether you do enough good. It's not about whether you hold on tight enough. It's not about whether you ride it out to the end. It's about what Jesus completed in his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things to enjoy? Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? God who justifies. Next question, who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died. Moreover, is even buried and risen again, who's seated at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Now, I told you last week that God often takes, in, the, in his word, he takes uh, very, very deep um, eternal truths and brings them down to our level. I really appreciate that. Don't you? I appreciate bottom shelf truth <laughs> that I can reach. And this is sort of, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a very lofty concept, but at the same time, it's also placed in terms that, that we can grasp and we can comprehend. And so he, he says it this way. He says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? Remember, we were, we were dealing with this idea of being, being in, in a courtroom and we're standing trial, right? Remember, we went to that little imaginary scenario, if you were here for that. Uh, and so he, he brings us back to that, and he says, if you're in a courtroom, now that you've been justified, okay, he's already dealt with the concept of justification, he says, now that you have been justified, photo op, uh, <laughs> who is he, <laughs> who is he 
who condemns? Who can bring a charge against someone that, that Christ has justified? Who can do that? Well, first of all, we understand the Bible says that Satan is the accuser who loves to remind us of our past, who loves to bring up our failures and our shortcomings. So, but, but he says, he says how, can the, how can the prosecuting attorney even bring a charge against those that God has justified and exonerated? How can the enemy possibly do that? So watch, here's this little earthly scenario that God kind of paints for us in a word picture. He says, even in that case, all right, put yourself back in the courtroom and the prosecuting attorney's making a very good case against you. He said, even in that scenario, Jesus is the one who is seated next to the Father on the throne, and by the way, he's there to make intercession for you. So even if the accuser could, and he can't, but even if the accuser could bring a charge against us in the courtroom of heaven, Jesus seated next to the Father, and again, this is sort of mind-boggling, but Jesus seated next to the Father is consistently there to say, "Uh, no, I took care of that. I already paid for that. That's already settled. There's nothing on her account anymore. You can't bring that charge up because we've already dealt with it. The gavel has already hit the judge's bench and they've been forgiven. You don't have a right now to bring up charges against the ones that I have redeemed. It's a wonderful, beautiful truth. And so we dealt with that last week, didn't we? So number three, y'all remember? Okay. Number three, here's what we didn't deal with. So if you pretend like you heard this already, I'm going to be ticked off. Because this is the point I didn't get to last Sunday, and it's so good. Notice this, number three. Here's the question. Here's I'm, I'm going to pose it this way. What if I feel like God's given up on me? That's a valid question because I've been there. There have been times in my life that I've screwed up so royally. Like, well, I, well, I, I'm not bragging, but when I do something, I do it very well. <laughs> Including fail. And I've failed God miserably, and there have been times in my life, in my journey, I have thought to myself, in my heart, in fact, believed that God gave up on me. I genuinely felt like the Lord was finished with me, that God had had just, you know, had enough of my nonsense and finally just washed his hands and said, I can't do nothing with this kid. He's he's, he's a mess up, he's a screw up, he's going to continue down this path. So so what what then, right? When my heart is the one that's telling me that God's done. You know, it's hard to get somebody to believe something that they don't believe, <laughs> isn't it? It's hard to convince somebody of something that they, that, they have, that they have formed a conviction over. I had formed a conviction in my heart, meaning I was thoroughly convinced that, that God was done. So what then? If I feel like God has, fa- or God has given up on me, that I failed him so miserably, that, that he's let loose of me, that he's just said, you know, this, this guy's never going to make it. He's going to continue down the same path, and, and he's never going to change. What if I feel like God has given up on me? Notice this in verse number 35. This is the coolest conclusion to any chapter in the Bible, in my opinion. Look what he says in verse 35. Who shall separate us? From the love of Christ. Now he, he presents a few scenarios that are possible. Tribulation, we all go through that. Times of difficulty. You ever been through a time of tribulation in your life, a season of testing and trial and trouble that you just felt like, man, God's nowhere to be found. He must have forgot me. He must be, he must be on the back nine or something because I can't get a hold of him. Y'all ever felt that way? He said, can tribulation do it? What about distress? I'm just freaking out. Y'all ever just have an internal freak out two or three times a week? Where are my people at? You know, just everything inside. I mean, uh, sometimes you look out, you know, externally, outwardly, and it all seems okay. And by anybody else's standards, they go, I don't know what you're worried about, but somehow in my mind, I have gotten so frazzled that everything is wrong. He said, can distress separate me from his love? What about persecution? What if What if people start coming at me? What if people don't like me? What if the world turns against me? What if good people, seemingly good people, begin to judge me? I know this would never happen, guys, but what if like church people, for example, this would be weird, totally wild if this ever happened anywhere, but what if church people got all judgy suddenly and started looking down their crooked nose at me like I was some kind of lesser than them? What what about that? What about persecution? Which, by the way, the persecution we face as American Christians is mild, I promise you. But he says, what, do you, what, do you, what do you even of that? What about famine? 
What if I'm just hungry, not because I chose to fast, but because, that gum, I just can't afford to buy any ramen noodles. What about famine? If you're so poor you can't buy ramen noodles, buddy, you're in bad shape, right? He said, what about famine? What about nakedness? Let's not elaborate on that. What about peril? We don't need that mental image floating around, do we? What about, what about peril? Just, just general trouble in life or sword? Is there anything that could separate me from the love of Christ? Now, now notice in verse 37, he says, yet in all these things we're more than conquerors to him that loved us. Now, verse 38, this gets interesting. Paul says, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life. I'm gonna, I don't normally put my, my intellect on display, but I'm going to for just a moment, and I'm not doing this to necessarily impress you, but you should probably be impressed, Okay. Everybody in this room right now is alive, and one day you'll be dead. Yep. Now you know. <laughs> so how about this? All right. So he throws out this arena. Can can life separate me from God? Can death separate me from God? What if, what if I die in a bad state of mind? Now listen, some of y'all have been raised in this environment. You were taught that, that if, if you died with unrepented sin, you would go to hell. Okay, now I'm not going to confess in too vivid of detail, but if, if perchance I got in, a, in, in just a very awful car accident, I'm going to tell you just straight up, probably the last thing coming out of my mouth before I die is not going to be spiritual. <laughs> okay, I've never, I, I haven't been in that situation in a very long time. I've uh, been in some bad car accidents, and I'm telling you, the last thing I said before I got knocked out was not, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> okay, well, we're going to stop there. But think about it. He says, can death, what if, what if right before I die, I say, you know, filth, flour, and flour, and filth, or something, you know? <laughs> what if I say, gum right before I die? Can death, am I going to be separated from him in death? I know it sounds silly when you put it out there, but this is the way some of us were taught. That if you, if you die with unconfessed sin, you haven't repented of every single sin, you're going to go to hell. That's rough. That's a difficult mindset to try to maintain and live within. He said, shall tribulation, that clock is wrong, by the way. You guys deceived me, and I'm very upset because that says 925, and I just looked at my watch. And it's five minutes till 10. So who's wrong here? That clock's wrong. Go with that clock. Go with it. We're, it's 925, folks. Don't look at your watch. <laughs> Read the rest of it with me. Read the rest of it. He says, for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, angels, that's, that's God's angelic host. They're not going to intervene and separate you from the love of God. Nor principalities or powers. And I believe that those are demonic spirits, because Paul talked about demonic, a demonic presence in Ephesians chapter 6 of saying we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And so we understand that statement is about, is about demonic spirits that could try to infiltrate and disrupt our lives and separate us from the love of Christ. He said, can they do it? Can a devil separate you from God? Can an angel from heaven separate you from God? He said, can, can things present? Or things to come. Now here again, about to boggle your mind. Everything right now is either right now or it's going to be. You're a tough crowd today. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Everything that's ever been has either been already, is right now in the present, or it's going to happen in the future. He said, is there anything in the present that can separate me from the love of God? No. Is there anything in the future that can separate me from the love of God? No. He says in verse 39, nor height, there's nothing above, nor depth, nothing below, nor any other created thing. Do you know there is only one being in time, eternity, past, present, future? There's only one being that was not created. God. 
God is the only eternal being. Eternity past, eternity future, God has always been. Here's what he says. You ready? After he goes through this laundry list of, uh, of hypotheticals, he says there is no created being. Here's why. That would include everything and everyone except God. You understand? So read it again. Let's throw it all together. I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing. No created thing can separate us from the love of God. You know who could separate us from the love of God? God. But you know what God said? He said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So the one who could cast you out said, I won't. I wish I had something exciting to give you today, guys. I apologize that I didn't come to the table more prepared to give you something that you should be able to get at least halfway excited about. The only one who could will never separate you because he already established in the verses we read prior to that he said, who shall lay anything against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died, was buried, and risen again, and is even at the right hand of the Father who makes intercession for us. So the only one who could said, I will never separate you. I will never cast you out. Jesus said, all who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. That means if you've come to him through faith and trusted in him, you are his. You're his. Now, remember, I got to hurry if I'm going to get through this introduction. Remember, I gave you... I gave you three foundational concepts. Remember this? I hope you, can, I hope you remember because I, I need you to hold on to this. These truths will help answer a lot of other questions you may have. Three foundational concepts. Number one, the concept of judgment. Y'all remember? I'm about to tie it together. I was throwing this out for a reason. The concept of judgment. We are culpable. We are accountable for our own actions. Living in a, in a, in a, in a, in a society that has, has really created victims out of people and sort of we, we've created this, this, uh, this, this, this mentality that uh, everybody owes us something and, and, and we're all entitled to things. You, you have to understand that's nonsense, don't you? You get that, right? That's nonsense. We're all accountable. You are an individual human being and you make your own decisions, your own choices. I understand things happen that we didn't choose, but we've made enough decisions on our own that we have to recognize the fact we are answerable for our own decisions. So the concept of judgment. Number two, we talked about the concept of justification or pardon. That, that in judgment, God grants pardon when we put our faith in Jesus. And then number three, we talked about the concept of perseverance, that, that, that there's this concept of, of continuing on in the faith, even through difficult seasons, even through dark valleys, there's this idea in the scriptures uh, that, we, that, that, that there's, a, there's an element of perseverance, that, that, that God will give us the strength to make it through. So I gave you those three things because I wanted to conclude this segment by saying this. Do you know what all three of those things have in common? Universally, all three of those things, judgment, pardon, and perseverance. You know what all three have in common? All three belong to God and God alone. You say, well, no, I'm with you on that, on the, on the judgment part. He's God alone. Yeah, I got it tattooed across my chest. Only God can judge me. I don't, but you probably do because you're a nerd. <laughs> right? Only God can judge me. We get that. And it's true. It's a true statement, isn't it? No, who cares what people think? God is the judge. We know that judgment belongs to God alone. Number two, if you've been with us and studied the scriptures long enough, you're, you're fully aware of the fact that God alone can justify. I can't justify my own sin. I can't make excuses and somehow talk my way out of it, <laughs> right? As good as we might be able to talk. There's no way that we can talk our way out of judgment. It's Christ alone that justifies. It's Christ alone that forgives. It's Christ alone that grants eternal life. So judgment belongs to God and justification belongs to God. But, but our continuation, our perseverance is also God and God alone who gives us the strength 
to persevere. Look at verse number 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. You know what Paul said in another place on this subject? He said, he said that, it, that, that, that God is the one who is able to keep what I have committed unto him against that day. Did you know that the Hebrew writer explained it this way? And he said, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. This is where it gets uncomfortable. But whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. And if you're without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you illegitimate and not the children of God? He said one of the surest ways that you can identify whether you've genuinely been born again into the family of God is whether or not you can get by with living in rebellion toward God. A good parent will never let their child continue in a state of rebellion and obstinance because you know exactly where that's going to lead them. And God knows where our obstinance will lead us. And so God deals with us in our rebellious times, in our rebellious moments when we just reject God and we, we, we go against what we know to be true in our hearts. It says when we do that, God, the good, good Father, will deal with us individually as his own children. That's comforting to me. It's not comforting at the, in the moment because I, I don't know about you, but whoopings are not all that fun. But it says God will deal with us as he deals with, his, with children, that, that he, will, he will make sure that we get back where we need to be. And sometimes he lets us wander for a while, and he lets us, as the prodigal son, leave the household and go out and learn the hard way, right? How many prodigals have walked away? Many of us have stepped away from God and we've turned our backs on God and we've done things even as Christians that we're now ashamed of because we got bitter or whatever circumstance got in our way and we turned our own way and we did our own thing and we got away from the presence of God but the presence of God never left us alone and he haunted us and he followed us and he went with us and when we were ready to get right and repent and turn back to him the father was waiting to put a new clean robe on us and a ring on our hand and shoes on our feet and he put us back where we belong. God is the one who will keep you in relationship with him. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that you, that you test this theory. But some of us have done that for you. And I can tell you based on the scriptures and I can tell you based on experience that God will not leave you alone as his child. Here's what I think I'm going to do. Mm, no, we're not getting through this. So here's what I'm going to do. All right. I'm going to just leave you with a lot of questions. Sound good? Give you something to come back for next Sunday because I'm telling you we're fixing to dive in to some deep stuff. So, but, but let, me, let me just give you this. All right. Very early on in this series, I asked a question and, and, and told you that, that we were going to try to answer this question throughout the series. And then I haven't, I haven't circled back to it until now. Okay. But here's the question I asked early on that I told you we would answer in the book of Romans. Why me? Why you? Of all the billions of people in the world that are alive today and that have been alive in our lifetime, why am I the one who heard the call of God? Why am I here today? Why are you sitting here today and not somebody else? Many of you know my story. I've, I've thought of it in this way because, again, we take truth and we sort of uh, translate truth through our personal experiences. In my personal experience, I, there, were, there were situations in my life when I was, when I was lost and, and just, just doing ungodly things and, and selling dope and doing dope and just living uh, this wasted party lifestyle constantly. I'm not, look, man, I wasn't a weekend warrior. I was a seven-day warrior, whatever that is. Partied every day of the week. But somehow in the midst of all that chaos that was going on inside my brain, in the midst of all the turmoil that I created for myself, in the midst of all the darkness and the depression and the suicidal thoughts and the, and the evil that tried to overtake my soul, even in the midst of that, there were times that God would interrupt my course of destruction. And God would deal with me and the Spirit of God would speak to me. And I can guarantee you, no matter what your journey has looked like thus far, you can look back along the path of life and see times that God was dealing with you and God protected you even from your, your own personal demise and destruction. The Spirit of God was there guarding you. Why is that? 
Why you and not somebody else? Why me and not somebody else? For, so, so question number one, is it because we're better than they are? Absolutely not. Am I a higher quality sinner? Like, you know, they're sinners, but we're top shelf sinners. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're that, we're that, that, that stuff they keep up top. Costs you a little bit more. I mean, is that, is that the case? Did God look at us and go, you know, ah, man, they're way too far gone, but that one's okay. I mean, how did we get here? Is it because we made better choices? I think sometimes we inadvertently look at life like that. Well, you know, I, I just made better choices. Well, but you, you got you to gotta accept the fact that you're still not better than anybody. Right. Your choices, by the way, and, I, and we dealt with this earlier on in the book of Romans, but Paul said, our will, our volition, our direction is, is broken by free will. We've made terrible choices. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, free will has taken many a soul to hell, but never a soul to heaven. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's not other people. That's y'all. That's me. We crave the darkness. By nature, we crave corruption and destruction. It's wild how, how much we self-sabotage. So we have to beg the question, is it because we made better choices? Is it, be, is it because we're, yeah, we're sinners, but we're better sinners? Like I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a higher quality sinner than, than the rest of them? So we're going to circle back and dive deeper into a very complicated subject that's introduced in verses 28 through 30. And, and these verses, and this is where I'm going to end because I know y'all can't handle real long preaching. Uh, but here's where we're going to end. Um, this subject is introduced in verses 28 through 30, and, and, they'll, and again, they'll serve as a preface for chapter number 9. So here's where we'll conclude. Notice this in verse number 28. He says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Now notice verse 29. This, I mean, it gets wild here. Whom he foreknow. Now remember, we're talking about the, the infinite all-knowing God that's, that's so much mightier and greater and bigger in magnitude and space and power and time than, than what we can even begin to wrap our minds around. That God knew us before the sand of time, sands of time ever began to fall through the hourglass. Whom he foreknew, here's what he did. You ready? He predestined. You know what predestination is? It means there were some things predetermined in your life. Whom he foreknew, knew. That's you. I'm just going to go on the assumption that it's all y'all because you're sitting here and you're listening, right? You confess Christ as Savior. That's who he's talking about, whom he foreknew. He predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And frankly, verse 29 would be easy if it weren't for verse number 30. Because verse 30 says, whom he predestined, these he also called. If you're here today and you're saved, you've heard the call of God. Not in an audible voice, much, much louder. In the very depths of your soul, you heard the voice of God calling you. Whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he glorified. Glorification is a reference to heaven. We haven't got there yet. But in the eyes of God, there's an ED at the end of that word. Because in the eyes of God, you're as good as in heaven. Glorified. I'm going to unpack that in, a, in much greater detail next Sunday, Lord willing. But I just want to conclude by, by maybe from my heart speaking to your heart. And I'm going I'm to sure this up with, with scripture. But I want to say to you that, that if, if you have put your faith and trust in Christ, if you're a child of God, you're safe in him. You're secure in Christ. See, here's what religion says. I've actually had preachers say this to me. It's crazy that I've, that I've, that I've had someone with the audacity actually say these words that I'm about to say to you. I've had preachers say to me, you know what, if I, if I preach that, I'm afraid people would stop living for Jesus. In other words, what he was saying without saying it was, I want to keep hanging them out over to hell so I can scare them into coming to church. I want to keep them in a constant state of fear 
Because if I, if I give them assurance, if, I, if, if they feel secure, they won't be motivated to, to live right. They're going to go out and do whatever. They're going to they're gonna live in sin, and they're going to do all these, these evil, wicked things. If I don't keep them, if I don't continually hang them out over hell as if they're just a, just a hair's breadth from, from dying without Christ and, and spending eternity in a, in a Christless, bottomless pit, right? And so religion has really leveraged our natural fears to sort of keep us in line, which is indicative of all dictators throughout history, by the way. A lot of dictators in religious, religious circles. But the Bible says that God's perfect love casts out fear, which means God's intent has never been for you to live in fear. In fact, he told Paul, write this down, Paul, God's not giving you the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear is a terrible motivator. Fear is a terrible reason to do anything. And so what he is essentially doing for us in this passage, and we're gonna gonna see the purpose of it next week, but what he's essentially doing for us in this passage is he's granting us the ability to live in peace and comfort. I'm not living my life daily in fear that, that if I step out of line, God's just gonna throw me in hell and give up on me. I don't worry about that. I'm not afraid of that. Now, let me use terms you would understand, because we all understand it this way. Uh, how, how great would it be, and some of you might be there, I'm definitely not, but how wonderful would it be to never have to worry about money? It'd be the life, wouldn't it? By the way, I have plans for um, like a commune we're going to build one day, and uh, it's going to be awesome. But anyway, stay tuned. I'm stirring the Kool-Aid. But... Um, <laughs> But how great would it be? I mean, seriously, think about this. How great would it be to just not have to worry about money? To get up on Monday and go, yeah, you know what? I ain't going in today. I ain't going to work. I don't feel like I'm going fishing. How wonderful would it be to live in that liberty, just that freedom of, man, my bills are taken care of, my house is paid off, my truck's paid off, everything's paid off. I ain't got to worry about nothing. Money just comes easy. It's free. I've got an endless account. It would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? you figure that out, let me know. That's not reality, but here, here is reality. And this is essentially what God's done. When it, when it, when it pertain, as it pertains to, to our, our account with him, he has given us everything. He's taken all of the perfection, all of the beauty, all of the holiness of Christ and placed it on our account. That's why Paul said, who can lay a charge against God's elect? Who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna add a debit to your account? Nobody can take anything out of your account. Christ is the one who died. Christ is the one who was buried. Christ is the one who resurrected to give you life, and you're safe in him. Those he, foreorda- or those he, he foreknew, he preordained, he predetermined. And those he predestined, these he also called. Those he called, them he also justified. Those he justified, these he also glorified. You're as good as in heaven in the eyes of God. It's settled because of Jesus. Tell me what you can add to that. What can you bring to the table? What could you possibly add to what Jesus has already done? The answer is nothing. So if you're here today and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, it's not about whether you said all the right words. I I remember struggling with this. For about two years as a new new Christian, I, I struggled with doubt. Because I heard all these sermons about repentance and I heard all these sermons about, you know, changing and 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 praying the right thing and saying the sinner's prayer and then they'd say the sinner's prayer and I'd think to myself well that's not what I said but they'd recite all these words and if you just pray this after me you can go to heaven when you die and I'd, I'd hear that and it would go dear Lord Jesus I know I'm a sinner and I turn from my sin and they'd have all this verbiage all the right words in place and I thought man I didn't I, uh, I don't know what I said I'm not sure I can't remember what I, I can barely remember what I had for dinner last night can't remember exactly what I said to God and I struggle with this doubt and this confusion of of man what if what if I didn't say the right thing what if I what if I wasn't sorry enough you know some guys present the 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 truth the doctrine of repentance as if as if you got to work up this this immense level of sorrow before God will forgive you like God just wants to see you writhe in pain and see your see your anguish 
before he can grant forgiveness. That concept's never found anywhere in the Bible. The word repentance simply means to have a change of mind. The light goes off and you go, oh, that's what I'm missing. It's not about you mustering up some level of sorrow to prove to God. God knows your heart. Are you kidding me? You got to put on some outward performance for God to now forgive you? That's, that's silly nonsense made up by religion. Jesus said, if you come to me, I will in no wise cast you out. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Christ, it amazes me how often people come to me and, and share with me later that they got saved in a service like this. We don't, we don't make a big push. I don't high pressure people to come forward and make a public decision. I, I think it's important for you to make a decision between you and the Lord. But once you've made that decision, I want to hear about it. I want to know because it, it, it amazes me what God is doing secretly in people's lives. So if you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I would encourage you right now in this moment, don't let another minute pass you by. Call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Just, just settle it. Just settle it. And if you're here today and you know you're saved, Christ has saved us and given us peace so that we can live for him in freedom and liberty by his grace and for his glory. Let's stand together. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we bow. And we ask for your blessing on this time now as we respond to your spirit speaking. Lord, I pray that you hear our cry in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise. king above.